My guest tonight first stepped into the pool when he was seven years old. And by the time he was 10, it splashed his way into the national record books. Michael Fred Phelps took a natural talent in the water and showed the world just how far hard work and sacrifice can take you. He has earned a record 22 medals, 18 of them gold through three different Olympics. On top of that, he would hold 33 world championship medals as well. But before he set 39 different world records, did you know he laid out a 12-year career plan at the age of 11, was diagnosed with ADHD as a kid, and was the youngest male at 15 to set a world record. Tonight, we'll learn what makes this undeniable icon who he is, a man who once said, if you want to be the best, you have to do things that other people aren't willing to do. Please welcome the most decorated Olympian of all time, Michael Phelps. Thank you. No problem. Uh, a couple things right off the bat. First of all, solid move with the no socks. Always have to. Casual. You're, not, you're just not a socks guy? Well, I mean, you told me yesterday it was, well, I got told yesterday I was wearing a suit and just moved to Arizona and I didn't bring a suit with me. <laughs> so I had to go and buy a suit. That's, so that's what you came up with? And then they, a they, pinch? They tailored it in a day. Well, that's what happens when you're Michael freaking Phelps. <laughs> what are you doing to your arm right now? Just stretching my arm. Just stretching my arm. What, what was, is that? I'm double jointed. I guess. Yeah. Did the person who tailored that suit for you know that yeah, that was a possibility? They, they, they made sure. They made sure to put a little extra room in there. Wow. <laughs> Towson, Maryland. What was life like in Towson, Maryland when you were a young pup? I mean, I grew up playing all sorts of sports. Uh, I played lacrosse, baseball, soccer, and swam. Uh, pretty much all at once. So my mom took me from one field to the next, to the next, to the next. The whole world, I think, fell in love with your mom, Debbie, uh, during the Olympics. But when you start diving into your story, what, what a great support system for you. I mean, it was incredible. You know, I, I grew up in a single, uh, single parent home, um, really from 11 on. And, and, you know, my sisters and myself sort of watched her uh, work, go to school, make sure we had everything we needed. And that's really who we learned from. Uh, and, and uh, you know, my mom is still the closest person to me and, and will always be that way. At one point, she said, I had three different kids in three different pools. I was going to school, getting a master's, was teaching, eventually becomes a principal. And all the while, it is teaching you these lessons. I mean, that now you're an adult. You look back, you Maybe. must think, well, <laughs> you're an adult most of the time. And you look back and you must think, you know, God, she did a lot for us. Well, she did, and, and, you know, I can never thank her enough. Um, you know, I'm so thankful to, to have a strong woman uh, like my mom be able to put me where I am today. Um, you know, that's, that's the reason I am who I am, and, and I act how I act. Um, we always joke, she wasn't the best cook, but she did everything <laughs> else right. <laughs> it's a, it would always be funny. We would always joke because it was like, the steak would be like uh, beef jerky or, you know, a <laughs> little, little overcooked. But uh, I guess the running joke is she always says, uh, if that's the one thing I didn't do right, I guess I'm doing OK. Yeah. You grew up with two older sisters. And from what I understand, it's really because of them that you were even in the pool yeah. in the first place. They're the ones, because they were there, that introduced you in a way to swimming. My mom put us in the water for water safety. That was the only reason. Uh, and, and my two older sisters fell in love with the sport as well. And when they were working out, I was running around, you know, sort of going crazy on the pool deck. But, you know, I learned how to swim. I didn't want to put my face under. Um, yeah, that's crazy. So when you're first introduced into it, you're about seven. Mm -hmm. And you didn't want to get your face wet or no. put your head under the water. Uh -uh. I started swimming on my back. So, so the woman... Who taught me how to uh, who taught me how to swim? Um, she found a way just to make me relaxed in the water, uh, and and that was by putting me on my back, and and I started swimming on my back, and then one day I just decided to overcome the fear and put my face under, 
And I fell in love with it and started swimming year round. And I had a lot of energy as a kid. And, and uh, I guess that was a way for me to get all of it out. I was super, super ADD. Uh, couldn't sit still. Um, and I was guess it even diagnosed the, back then? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, your mom just knew you were full of energy. I, I took Ritalin until I was in like sixth grade. And then I told my mom that I didn't want to take it anymore. Um, I just said I, I would be able to focus. And, and um, you know, I fell in love with the sport of swimming really early. And, and that kind of helped me focus. And, you know, for me, my mom would always, being in education, um, education always came first. And, and if that wasn't going well, then I wasn't going to be able to swim. And that was something that um, I wanted to do and I loved. So I took care of everything else out of the pool so I could make sure I could do everything in the pool. I had, I had a child in swimming, and, and I thought, and she was much the same way, but staring at that black line. <laughs> I mean, that first of all, that can get you focused. It, it can also drive you freaking nuts. Yeah. I mean, that, that can be a lonely existence in a pool during practice. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, I, I used to, um, I guess it's different now, but I used to sing songs. I mean, I used to think about a lot. I used to think about what was going on outside of the pool. Um, that was kind of my way to just sort of let everything out. You know, as a kid, that was an escape. You know, as a kid growing up in, in the household that, we, that I was in, that was an escape from everything. So it was like, it was the one chance where I didn't have to think about anything or deal with anything or be around anything. It was just me by myself in the pool. During that time, you're going through a lot out of the pool. Sure. I mean, a big change sure. in your home and dealing with divorce and everything else that you had to deal with, which a lot of people yeah. have to deal with. You know, for me, my, my father was very absent through a, a lot of my life. And, and um, you know, for about 20 years, I can probably count on one hand how many times I saw him. Um, and that kind of hurts. You know, for me, I, I grew up always wanting to have a dad, to have somebody, you know, to, whether it's to throw a catch or, you know, do this or do that, and, and I didn't have it. And, uh, you know, so for me growing up, I had my coach who kind of acted as a father figure. And there was a time when you were 11, I believe, that he wanted to have a meeting with your mom, Debbie. That's the meeting he has with your mom to say, to say this kid is different, and it's time that he puts all of his energy into swimming, right? Yeah, it was, he, he said to me when I was 11, if I wanted to make the Olympic team, in four years, I could. And for some strange reason, I said, OK. Let's be fair. At 10, you were setting records mm -hmm. as well. I mean, I, I probably, I think I, I must have broken over 200 national age group records as a kid growing up. And I was a little kid that was swimming with people that were four, five, six years older. And older kids never let me go. They wouldn't let me go in front of them. So I had to pass them. So it was like, I mean, there's like five people in a 25-yard lane, and you know, here I am just puttering along, going in and out, of, <laughs> like weaving in and out How of people. How great is that? And by the end of the set, I'm, I'm leading the lane. And I looked up to Pablo Morales. He was world record holder, Olympic gold medalist, professional athlete. Um, you know, I had a bunch of autographs and stuff, and, and I was like, that's what I want to do. I mean, what do I have to lose? As an 11-year-old kid, I was like, okay, cool. If I make the Olympic team in four years, great. If not, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Well, he made you, or you made you, I want to ask the question, who made you? Write down this goal sheet. So these are specific times yeah. that you laid out for yourself at 11. Yeah, well, when, I, when I talked to Bob about this, he said, what you don't know that's on the other side of this page <laughs> was the first thing you wrote was, I want to win a gold medal. <laughs> and then you thought, oh, maybe that's too much. And you scratched it out, turned it over. And, wrote and the thing was, I want to make the Olympics. Yeah. And look um, at that bottom line. I'll accomplish his goals by concentrating. Working hard. And coming to every practice. <laughs> it's about right. But it's, it, it's, it's really the whole entire thing that, that's still like the motto I live by today. It's dream, plan, reach. You know, it's like you come up with a dream, you figure out how you're going to get there, and you go for it. Like, what's the worst that happens? You fail? Great. Get up and do it again. It, it's, it's that easy. And is that how you swim? Is that how you swim with regard to time as opposed to 
competition and other individuals and medals or whatever. You're that's looking at times. Yeah, that's it. That's the only thing. That's all you got. Yeah. If I, I mean, I can win a gold medal and not do a time and not be happy. I'm hard on myself. Your mom set the bar high, though. Of course. I mean, I, I mean it's like, you know, I do believe that, that you know, watching her work as hard as she as she did and still does, um, she has high goals for herself. And and you know, it's I I kind of laugh when she when she talks about stuff that she goes through and she doesn't get there. And I can just see the emotion and how pissed or upset she is, um, just sort of because she fell short and she did. She doesn't like that. She doesn't like failing. We don't like failing. We we don't deal with it very well. She talked about a race where you didn't win. You right. wanted something really badly. But I launched my goggles. Yeah. That one? Yeah. And she, she you came that. over to her and said, she said, OK, you didn't win the race, but right now everybody's watching you and how you react to not winning that race. Mm -hmm. And you better act the way you want to be seen by these people. Wow. It's pretty powerful. I remember the race. It was at Towson University. I lost the 200 IM. And I, I literally took my cap and goggles and just launched them. Yeah, I was a stubborn little kid. I, was stubborn. <laughs> so I, I went through phases in high school where I wanted to quit. I didn't want to do it anymore. I wanted to go on the golf team. That would have gone well. <laughs> but it, I, I wanted to quit. I didn't want to do it anymore. I didn't want to deal with my coach. I didn't want to deal with anything. And you know, my mom would just say, "Make sure you think about all the decisions or you know all the outcomes that's gonna every outcome that is gonna happen if you don't do this." And we would think about it. And, and when you look at the trajectory of those early years, I mean, here you are at seven, afraid to put your face under the water. There you are at 15, and there's a lot going on in between there, competing in an Olympics. <laughs> this is not like yeah. the, the high school Olympics, the Olympics yeah. in Sydney. I mean, I stepped out as a 15-year-old in Sydney where swimming is the biggest sport. I was next to, next to or two lanes over from an Australian. The floor was shaking from it just being so loud and so just, I mean, there was so much energy in that building. And I didn't have my suit tied behind the blocks. I, there, I mean, there were a lot of things that went probably wrong that I could have fixed. What do you mean you didn't have your suit tied behind the My suit wasn't tied when I dove in. I didn't tie my suit before the race. Is that out of nerves? Is that ADHD? I don't know. I have Is no that... clue. No clue. I, 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 I didn't know what to do. I mean, I, I don't know. I got lucky and made the Olympic team and made the final and <laughs> just went out and swam. Um, wow. <laughs> That's mind blowing. But it, it's, you know, it's like at that age, like, I guess for me, just I prepared for it in a way. Um, you know, I can look back at it and say that was a big part of me being able to get to where I am. Uh, I wanted to medal. I was back in the water training the next day. People were taking breaks and doing this or doing that, and I was in the water training. Six months later, I broke my first world record. I remember sitting down with my agent, Peter, uh, at 15 in the lawyer's office, and I looked at him and said, I want to change the sport of swimming as a 15-year-old kid. I said, that's what I want to do. So you don't medal in 2000 as a 15-year-old. What was your mindset in 2004? For me, like, in 2004, the trials, I broke the world record in the 400 IM. My first race in, in uh, Athens was the 400 IM. And I broke the world record and won my first gold. 408, 401. Michael Phelps about ready to get his first Olympic medal. It's going to be gold. And it's going to be a new world record. One down for Phelps. You can hear Dan Hicks say there, one down for Phelps. It's like, okay, he got the on one, the next one yeah. but on to the next one. What did it feel like the first time you're on the highest platform at the Olympics, getting your medal and listening to the Star Spangled Banner being played? Um, no, it, it's, it's just dreams coming true. Um, you know, it's hard to put it into words, really, what it feels like, but it's, you know, there's nothing better than that. There's nothing better than standing on top of the metal podium, listening to your national anthem play with your hand across your heart, um, and just knowing that the hard work paid off to get you there. I think a story I'll never forget is, some people know it, but it's, uh, 
they had this chain linked fence in between where the uh, spectators could pass through and see the warm down pool. So it, it, it split us. And my mom came over after the 400 IM and, and uh, I walked over to her and I passed the medal through the chain link fence. And I looked at her and said, I did it. And obviously she went into a DP moment, which is DP moment is she starts to cry. That would so, be DP for Debbie Phelps. Yes. So, um, <laughs> You know, sort of having that moment where, you know, she was a part of, you know, every step and, uh, you know, being able to accomplish something that you put your mind to feels pretty good. And that you did, winning eight medals, six of them gold in the 2004 Olympics. And suddenly overnight, Michael Phelps is a household name. What, what, what's that like? I mean, it kind of made me just realize things and, and, you know, it's like everything I do today doesn't matter what it is. People are watching everywhere. Um, and that so. can really, really wear somebody down. For sure. And you, you've had battles with that. Of and course. you've had public incidents. A couple. A couple. A couple. <laughs> you, you've yeah. had three. That you've yeah. had three that everybody's aware of. Yeah. And I say everybody, you know, most people don't really people care. People in the world. Everyone people in the, the world. world. <laughs> but when it's you, you feel like everybody cares. Sure. People really don't I was in, I've been in dark places after those, after those days. So the first DW, DUI happens after, after all the success in the Olympics. Uh, 04, yeah. In Athens. How did that make you feel when you came back home? I came back home and I was in my lawyer's office and, and uh, I saw the look on my mother's face. Never want to see that again. I mean, that was, that's just brutal because it's like, you know, she taught us, you know, she, she never taught us to do that. And she never taught us to make those mistakes and um, that hurt me. Um, and she's an educator. Yeah. So yeah, that, I mean, that, that stung. Uh, a lot. But you're a kid. Yeah. I mean, you're a kid. And, and there's a standard that you have to be held to, rightly or wrongly, because now you're this nationally known Olympic hero, and eyes are on you more than they've ever been. That, that's a lot, of, a lot of weight to carry around. It was hard, and it's something that I guess it, I just kind of got used to. But at, at that time, it was... Yeah, I, I was a kid. I mean, I literally, I'd never done anything in my life. You know, most of my childhood was in a bubble. I guess it's like I got let out of the bubble and didn't know what to do. I had no idea where to go. So I was like, oh, I just obviously didn't make the right choice. And um, luckily, nobody else, no one was hurt, uh, not myself or anybody else. And, and you know, for me, the, bi the, the thing that probably bothered me the most was just the disappointment that were on their faces. Um, I don't like letting people down and, and you know, when I think not only like I, I, I didn't only let them down, but in my opinion, I let other people down. I let my family down. I let people who support me down. Um, and I think that probably was one of the first times where I kind of went into, I mean, I went into a depression spell probably. I mean, that was probably the first time. Did you go through therapy for depression no. or you just no. kind of lugged that around? Yep. That was, you know, that was part of really what I carried from really that time until a couple months ago. Till a couple months ago? I, can, I was really good at compartmentalizing things, just shoving things away, not dealing with it. If something came up, I would shut the door on it and just let it build up. And then... And then, then that, lash that would, out, I guess. If that would usually be when Bob and I would go at it. You know, like he would say something to really tick me off and... I would say, you know, I'd throw a little jab back at him. And that was the start of it. And then we just blew up at one another and the next day I'm fine. Um, and, and, you know, I think growing up, we had a lot of that. You know, I, I guess it can go back to my father. Um, you know, sort of, he never, he, his father died very young and, and he raised me how he was raised. You know, so I didn't really know what to do, where to go, how to act, do this or that. My mom did the best she could. Um, but it's like, those are, those are kind of times where, um, I need a father. I needed a father. I wanted a father, uh, and didn't have one. So after this 2004, this glorious Olympics, 
you have the DUI moving past that, what's the drive now for the games in Beijing? What's, what, what is out there for you to chew up and try and accomplish? Going eight for eight. Eight for eight. Eight for eight. And, and it's, it's amazing. I mean, the record was Mark Spitz. Were you, were you even aware, really, as a kid? You're so, you're so Honestly, sure. I, really, I didn't even know who he was until I was probably like 15, 16 years old. But then you were aware that he had won seven. Sure. I mean, that's a, it's an iconic. It's an iconic feat at the Olympic level. I mean, at any sport, really. Um, it's just incredible. And, you know, back then it was, it was, I mean, those guys, he was swimming with a mustache and no goggles. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Right. Jeez. <laughs> We, we do it in, like, high-tech suits and high-tech goggles and right. caps and all this stuff. I mean, seriously, a mustache would literally slow you down. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I went... And then he had a hell of a mustache. Was it was a like stash. a Magnum P.I. I mustache. mean, I... <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta respect a good stash. That was, that was <laughs> you a do. good stash. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it changed a lot. I mean, I don't know if some of you guys saw it. I looked like... Uh, I mean, I, had, I hadn't shaved in, like, I don't know three to four months going into nationals. Like, I, I mean, it was, it was bad. It was really bad. Um, so I went 157 in a full beard. And when I shaved my, my body and my face, uh, I went 152. You had five seconds of hair on you? I guess. <laughs> I guess. So you set this goal for yourself to, to be beat perfect. the record. It wasn't to go out and break Spitz's record. It was to, I mean, essentially was, but that wasn't what I was thinking. I didn't want to become the second Mark Spitz. I wanted to become the first Michael Phelps. We have this quote back on the wall. If you want to be the best, you have to do things that other people aren't willing to do. What does that quote, though, specifically say to you? I want to be the best that I could be in the best that anyone's ever seen. And I'm going to work as hard as I can to be able to get there. You know, going 365 days a year for five or six years straight, you know, I didn't miss a day. Um, and that That's was a lot of sacrifice. But it, it's, it is, but it's also because I knew that nobody else was doing it. So at that point, if I'm getting 52, you know, normal people are swimming six days a week. So I'm getting 52 other days ahead of them. That means birthday swimming, 4th Christmas. of July swimming, Christmas. Christmas morning. Before, before we open presents, Christmas, got to go swim. <laughs> and that was you mm -hmm. saying, somebody take me. My mom took me. Mom or sister took me. If sisters were home from school, they would take me and work out. But to get to eight for eight, you had to win that second race as part of a team. Let's just take a watch, and your reaction says it all about how important this, this was relay was. Pretty fired up. Finals of the men's 4x100 freestyle relay. The Americans have to win Golden here if Phelps is to keep his hopes alive of surpassing Mark Spitz. The United States try to hang out a second. They should get the silver medal. But Lezak is closing a little bit on Bernard. Can the veteran chase him down and pull off a shocker here? Well, there's no doubt that he's tightening up. Bernard is losing to ground. Here comes Lezak. Unbelievable at the end. He's done it. The U.S. has done it. He did it. Yeah, he, did it. he did it. He did it. Phelps his hopes alive. What, what do you mean? I mean, I remember being glued to the television, watching the touch and, and how close that was and the, the time and the space that was made up. But when you say the French gave you that, oh, they screwed what does up. that mean? They're, they're, his finish was awful. He looked over underwater. He lifted his head up. He climbed. I mean, there are a couple things, like, I can look at and see that, I mean, the guy just didn't finish the race. They had the race won. I mean, they, they were almost a body length ahead of us going to the last 100 or going to the last 50. I mean, Bernard literally just... I mean, it was like there was 10 pianos on his back the last 10 meters of that race. He didn't move. And now you've got a chance to win all eight. Take us through those. As, as, as the medals are piling up, as the golds are piling up, is the pressure at all on you? You know, it, it was like, 
After the first night, 400 IM, 400 free relay down. 200 free was the next day. The final of that race is probably one of my greatest races of all time. Um, just how it was swum, stroke, everything was just perfect. The race was over at 15 meters. I mean, I had almost a body length at 25, but over. When I swam the 200 fly blind, pretty much, because my goggles filled up with water, I ended up breaking the world record by a couple one hundreds, and I was pissed because I I left I left more in the pool, you know. Like I I'm lucky to finish the race and win because I couldn't see, but how do you swim and not be able to see? Count strokes. So you're basically counting strokes, knowing where you'll be mm -hmm. by the end of the lane and where the end of the pool. We do these things called stroke and time for butterfly. So when I'm trying to work on butterfly pace, if I go 27 seconds, I have to take 17 strokes. But I can't take more than five kicks. So what we're really trying to do is work on stroke efficiency. And I've done that my whole entire career. So I mean, my first 50 is usually 16, about 16 strokes, and then it's like 17, and then I go 18, and then the last one's usually 19 or 20 when I try to pick it up coming into the wall. Fifth medal in boys, 800 free relay, 200 IM, 100 fly. The seventh was 100 fly. And yeah, and I was, that was just the one one hundredth of a second. I still watch it, and I'm just like, it's not possible. Like, but it's like, but, but then it's like, once I look at it and see the slow-mo, like I can watch Kavix uh, finish, and he kind of just botched the finish. And I was able to do what I practiced to do hit the wall hard. And when I took that half stroke at the, at the finish of the 100 fly, I thought that cost me the race. And it ended up winning the race for me. So as these medals are piling up, literally you're not thinking it's within reach now? No, I, I think, you know, the biggest thing that I was thinking of the whole entire time was after the race, I swim down. Swim down into making sure I have like a power bar or some kind of bar like to put calories back into my system. And at that time, it was uh, carnation instant breakfast. I would drink that right after my race because it was protein. And I put it right back into my system. So I was on top of that quick recovery, recovery. Uh, after everything was done for the night, I'd make sure swim down, eat, uh, massage right into a cold tub, right into a 50 degree ice bath for seven minutes. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, oh. how, that's how my, that's about what I looked like. That was oh, the first, first look I had when I jumped in. 50 degrees? It's like 50, 52 degrees, yeah. And that, what, is, what does that provide Just releases you? everything. So prior to the race for medal number eight, business as usual, are you thinking, okay? No, we were ready and to be honest, that was a race that we've never lost in Olympic history. Kind of went out and did what we always do. Let's take a watch. So Michael Phelps, seven for seven with gold medals at these Olympics. Waiting to see if he will stand alone in Olympic history and pass Mark Spitz. Lisa is going to break the world record. Trying to stay ahead of Sullivan and Lisa, the hero in the fourth. It didn't sink in for a long time um, of what I, with what I had accomplished that week. Has it fully set in? Probably not. Um, more now than it ever has been. Um, you know, I kind of realize <laughs> what I did. Um, yeah, I mean, at some point, you got to allow yourself the ability to look back. You know, I, I don't look at those medals. I haven't really. I mean, I've read that about you, that you really, you don't display them. They're not out in a big trophy case in the Phelps house. Where are they? I'm not telling you guys. I'm not, I'm not telling you. I'm not telling you. I'm not going to steal them. I just want to. <laughs> nah, they're, I mean, they. Are they in a bank? Are they in a bag? Are they under your bed? Are they, where are they? They're in a spot that probably only three people know where they are. They're somewhere. I'm not telling you where they are. Well, <laughs> 
I mean, who gives a shit? Where are they, really? <laughs> There's, there's actually a, a picture I just found uh, in my old house. It's, uh, I went up and I remember after the eighth medal, we walked off the medal podium and we're walking down the side of the pool and, and it's right in front of all the photographers. And I mean, you couldn't get through. There were so many of them, it's ridiculous. So I, I pretty much just pushed them all out of the way. I was like, guys, move out of my way. Like, I want to get to my mother, like, the hell out of the way. And, uh, I went up and I, I was hugging and kissing her and, and my family was there and there was a circle around me of photographers and uh, an overhead camera took a shot of it and I have it at home. But that moment was something special and, and um, you know, we share moments like that after every meet and you know, just without that support every day, no matter what, it wouldn't have been possible and, and uh, you know, my mom's the best. After that 2008 Olympics, is when the picture. Oh, that's the second one came out. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> that's when the picture of you and the bong yeah. hit yeah. the world. A couple things happened with with the bong picture to me. First of all, what really doesn't sit well with me is that there was a real hardcore violation of you and what you were doing sure. in your private time. Yeah. For whatever mistake you made. I would more blame the person and think the person's lower on the totem pole for turning that picture in. And from what I know from talking to people close to you, you know who that person is. There were, there were six people in that house. And one person that I didn't really know is the one. I know who it is. I know his name. What can I do? I was told that you were told by your lawyer, I can make that person's life a living hell. And you said no. That kid's got to look at himself in the mirror every day. And, you know, I mean, karma's a bitch. You know? And, and you know, it's like, you know, for me, for me, it's like, yeah, it's, yeah, I, I messed up. And, and I made a choice to do that. Nobody twisted my arm or did anything or this and that. I, I put myself in that position. And somebody took a picture. I mean, you know, and, and, you know, the thing for me, it's like, I understand, you know, for me doing what I've done, I've essentially written away privacy. You know, there are certain places where I can be, where I can be left alone. And, you know, that's why my fiance, my, my, my fiance and I, we're homebodies because we want to be left alone. You know, we want to be able to, to sit and watch a movie and not have anybody, you know, jump in or here or there. You know, for, like, I mean, this morning, like, we went out to a restaurant, and after I ate, people came up and asked for a picture. That's no problem. But while I'm eating, I want to be left alone. You know, so there are certain things in my life that I always have to do. And, and, and that's one thing that when, when we're out in public that we make sure that if we're eating, we're eating, and we're engaged with one another. Um, or, or, you know, like I said, I don't, I don't leave my house very often. I, I just want to be... Isn't that a shame, though? It is, but, it, it, you know, it's... It, you know, like I said, it's a way of life nowadays. It's, it's, what, it's what this world is. You know, it's like, you know, sometimes, yeah, it'd be cool to, you know, we do go to movies from time to time, but whatever. I mean, I go to El Dorado and play golf, you know. <laughs> you, know right. you know, I get away. I, I, there, there are certain places that we go where we can be left alone and, and you know, we can be normal people because that's, that's what I am. I'm a, I'm a normal person. I'm a normal person who... Except for this thing. <laughs> But I'm a normal person just like everybody else in here. I, I, I happen to, to be good at swimming and, and I found it at a young age and I became very passionate about it and I just chased my goals. That's really it. And sure, that got me to where I am and you know, it's great, but I'm just like you guys. You know, I like to sleep. I like to go and have a nice meal. I like to watch a movie. Like, I like to eat candy, like whatever, like whatever it is. Like, I'm, I'm normal, you know, like, and, and I look at myself that way. It's just, I just found something that, that I guess I'm decent at. Where was your training after that leading, and it's a long lead in. To 12? To 12. Training? What training? training? What training? You didn't train? Oh my gosh. Training between 08 and 12 was a joke. Uh, after 08, I probably gained about 20 pounds. Quick, 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 quick. 
I mean, th there were phases where I would swim for a week and then I would disappear for a week or two. I would just say, I'm not coming. I mean, I would just, whether it was me just skipping workout because I wanted to play golf or wanted to travel and just be a kid. Um, Do you feel like you missed out on, on some of the kid stuff? Um, you asked me that today and I can say whatever. You would ask me that three, two, probably a year or two ago, I would have said yeah. Um, because it's just like, the stuff that, that, that my friends did as kids were like, I mean, yeah, they did it and they have different lives than I do. So would I ever trade my life for anything? No. Um, not even moments in my life, because they've all made me stronger and they've all made me a better person. How would you characterize the 2012 Olympics for you in London? I've had two races in my Olympic career that I haven't medaled. My first one and the 400 I am in London. Um, Bob and I talk about that so many times. I, it's like I didn't swim it the way I wanted to or prelims, I shouldn't, I, I just shouldn't have, I shouldn't have been in that final. I didn't deserve to be in that final. Um, because of what went work. into that, you weren't I ready? I didn't work, no, I didn't work to swim that race. And even though you weren't at your best, you won four gold medals in London and then another DUI. I know from people close to you, whether it's Bob, your coach, or friends that we have in common, that that second DUI has changed your life and may have been one of the most important things to ever happen to you. Sure. Um, you know, I remember, I mean, literally, I was talking in the call that night when I was coming home. I was like, yeah, hey, I'm almost home. Instantly. Uh, I knew it when the, car, when the car came that close to my, uh, my tail that I was getting pulled over. Um, I didn't even say anything. Just got out and <laughs> did what I, you know, did everything and I sat in the car and I just literally, I felt just terrible. I didn't leave my room for like five days. Didn't eat. Didn't want to talk to anybody. If you, want, if you, if you were trying to communicate with me, texting was the only way. My TV wasn't working in the room. I mean, I just sat there. I was crying. I was pissed. Didn't want to be alive. I mean, there's so many things going on in my head. You Maybe didn't want to be alive. I, I mean, to me, it was just like I just continued to let people down. And I mean, I remember texting Peter, my agent. I was like, the world would just be a better place without me. Didn't know how I would do it. Um, but I just didn't want to be here anymore. Did it get close? No. It, it just thought. It was, it was, it was just, in your mind. Yeah, it was just in my mind. Uh, I mean, that was the lowest I've ever been. I mean, I was, I was on a downward spiral. <sighs> I, mean, I was skipping floors. I mean, I was going down so fast. Um, I pushed everybody away. What changed for you after that? I was, I was in a, uh, in an apartment building in D.C., outside of D.C., and with my agent, my publicist, my lawyers, just figuring out everything. How'd you go about figuring that out? Uh, I went to a treatment center. Um, and, uh, I mean, that's probably the, the most afraid I've ever been. So what we did was we flew private, so nobody knew where I was. Nobody knew where I was going. Nobody saw me land anything. And I got off the plane and got into the car, and I started just shaking. Shaking, because I was so terrified. Um, I remember sending that text to my mother. I never got a response back. Which, what text? I'm afraid. I was like, I'm afraid for the first time in my life. Um, so I, I check in, I get into the treatment center, and, and uh, phone goes in, computer goes in, take everything. No, but, like, I had, like, crossword puzzles. They took those. You know, like, I had candy. They took that. Um, gum, because it had sugar in it. Can't have that. Uh, I went, to, I went to dinner that night, didn't want to talk to anybody. There's an American flag in the, in the cafeteria and I stared at the American flag with my back towards everybody. I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to talk to anybody. 
I wanted to be left alone. The first thing every morning, I wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I have this chart on the wall, feelings check. Feelings check. Like the eight basic like emotions or feelings, or whatever. They're like, how do you feel this morning? It's 6 o'clock in the morning. I was like, how do you think I feel? <laughs> like, seriously? Uh, I was just, I mean, I was just pissed. So you, you were fighting the process. Yeah, and then it was the first or second night there, and uh, we're watching Monday Night Football on ESPN. And uh, this kid's swimming. I'm on a commercial break, comes on TV. And it's ESPN reporting that I had been suspended for six months and not competing at World Championships. Like 15 people just turned over and looked at me. And I was like, yes, that's me. <laughs> yes. Um, so that, that was kind of, that was kind of awkward. Did you get a chuckle at all out of I, that? People laughed. Okay, good. Um, I mean, and I think one thing that kind of sucked too is that's kind of the first, the first time that I had really found out that I wasn't, go, I wasn't going to be competing at Worlds. You didn't know that you were suspended for that length of time? Or I knew least, I was suspended. But not, I knew I was getting suspended. But not eligible for the Worlds. I didn't know that. Until you were sitting there in a rehab facility and saw like, it on oh, TV. Oh, cool. I was like, all right, well, I'm not, I'm not going to Worlds. But then a couple days into it, I was like, you know what, I'm here. I'm taking it with open arms. And, and you know, I was, I was pretty much the first one into every meeting. I was the first one into group therapy. I was the first one into, you know, first one into the gym, gym in the morning at 5 o'clock. You know, like, I was, I was focused. I read every night. I, I tried to unload all of this stuff that had built up inside of me for so many years. And I was like, I'm just going to take this thing head on and see what happens. One of the first days, my therapist really went at me. He go, we were explaining everything, and I was always told I was supposed to be the bring the family back together baby, because I'm so much younger than my sisters. So I said that to my. Whoa, 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 whoa! I mean, I, you're, I don't you're five it. just because you're five years younger. I don't believe it. You carried around with you the burden of being. I didn't even think about the it. person or the object that was going to bring your mom and dad back together. I mean, that that's an impossible it's crazy. It's crazy. ask of a child. It's crazy. Who told you that? I don't even remember. I don't even remember where it came from. But it, but it laid in there. Oh, for sure. Um, so what I did was I wrote a letter to my father, expressing feelings. I wrote a letter to my mother. And I wrote a letter, wrote a letter with my left hand to my inner child. And, and the cool thing that, that I remembered about my inner child was standing in the backyard of my old house on Chesapeake Avenue. Uh, and I can still picture him today. And, and um, the therapist goes, what would you want to do? And I said, I would just go over and hug him. Because that was the kid that didn't care about what anybody else thought about them. They were themselves. And, you know, I found myself one day, um, one day after that, and I was like, you know what? I was like, why did I do that? Why did I change who I really am? You know, I, I don't know if I was somebody different because of what I've done, but I think right then and there is when I just started showing more of really who I am and not caring. You know, just sort of being completely open. I think the world is starting to see really who I am and not who I've just shown who I was. You know, I'm, I'm a, I'm, this is the real Michael Phelps. When you're able to sort of get things out into the open and talk, talk to people about things or talk to, you know, for me to talk to my father about things, like that kind of lifted a lot off my shoulders. And, and I'm to the point now where it's like my father's becoming my friend again. And I think, you know, for me, that's, that's what I've always wanted. And I think that's something that, that I'm very thankful for that I've been able to go through over the last year. Your fiancé who's backstage. Yeah has been such a gift. Uh, Nicole and I have been on and off for eight years. Uh, last July, this past July, eight years on and off. And, and uh, uh, after the second time, we took a long time off, a long time apart, didn't talk. And, and uh, you know, I always said if I ever had the chance to have her back in my life, that that would be the woman that I marry and spend the rest of my life with. And 
Um, we recently got engaged in February, and planning a wedding is really fun, guys. <laughs> yeah. It's great. Um, but, but, you know, for, for her and I, the amount of stuff that we've gone through, both personally, publicly, um, we're so much stronger now, and we're so much better now. Uh, this is the best we've ever been, and, and uh, honey, you're gonna be pissed I'm saying this, but I'm saying it. Uh, we have this competition every morning that whoever gets up first and says it to the other person first, they get to say it for the rest of the day. So um, I'm usually really good at it, and she doesn't get me that often, but uh, I usually wake up and just say I love you more. She beat me today, and it really bothers me. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's like, you know, if, like if I, when I say I love you, she has the privilege of one-upping me until the next morning when we wake up, and then it's kind of like a little contest we have, so. Uh, she Don't ever lose today. that. No. Uh, I mean, I, I, have, so I, I love her to death, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we're just perfect together, I think. So, Michael, what's next? You know, my mom said she wanted to see me in Rio again. She wanted, wanted to, she wanted me to go another four years and see me in Rio. Uh, and I actually want to go. You know, that's why I came back. And, and you know, the, after, you know, saying to her, I said to her, I was like, we're back. I was like, we are, we are in a good position. Uh, and I can say that for the first time since 2008. Like, this summer, like, before nationals, like, I went to nationals. I, I was like jittery because I was so excited to swim. Because I knew for the first time in seven years, I was finally prepared again. I was ready to swim fast. And I wanted to just unleash. All right, here's how we end it. These are five questions I've never seen. They're fun questions. They're not written by me. I've not looked at them until I cracked this seal All right, open. Let's go. Do I get to see them? No. <laughs> you get to answer them. All right. Would you rather have to sew all your own clothes or grow your own food? Grow my own food. I'm with you. <laughs> Would you rather only sweat eggnog? Or only cry spaghetti sauce. What? Who makes? Just it? answer the question. Jesus. I'm sending these to Costas for the next Olympics. Oh jeez. Uh, sweat eggnog. Sweat eggnog. Yeah. What would you rather do on that one? Uh, I think sweat eggnog. Cry spaghetti just seems messy. <laughs> That's like that. Could get, I mean, and, and lately I've been more emotional, so I don't know if I would like that. Now that you're in touch with yeah. the inner Michael. Yeah, I know. Would you rather have a photographic memory? I have one of those. <laughs> or, go ahead. Or gain an extra 40 IQ points. I mean, obviously, it's like the, the uh, IQ Because you already points. have the other. Yeah, I have the other so one. So you get so. the 40 IQ points. Good. Best would of you, both worlds. Would you rather babysit a nonstop crying infant for a day or have an unwanted house guest for a week? Uh, I'd take the unwanted house guest, because I can deal with that. I can just close them off now. You can just shut them, shut yourself off. Yeah, I just, I just, yeah, I can get rid of them. That, it, that's not, that's not challenging. I've had that before. It's not but hard. you'd put up with that for a week instead of one bad day with a kid? Yeah, dude, dude. <laughs> I mean, it, Does you know, Nicole know you feel this way? 24 hours. If we have a kid, if we have a kid, it's not going to cry for 24 hours. It's going to be happy for some of them. I mean, come on. We're sleeping. Yeah. Fair enough. Would you rather be able to see into your own future with a 50% accuracy rate, or other people's with a 100% accuracy rate? I, I can't even wrap my mind around that yeah, question. Can you read that again? <laughs> I think other people's. 100% accuracy yeah. into the future. Yes. So you could know what Nicole will be doing 20 years from now. Yeah, hopefully we come up with some cool idea. Yeah. It, it market something? Yeah. Cocktail umbrellas. <laughs> uh, 
I, I've known you for a couple of years. Yeah, a couple of years. Um, I, I never expected to have you or any guest be this open, and uh, your honesty is is much appreciated. And uh, I thank you for being a guest here on Undeniable. Oh, it's my pleasure, Michael Phelps.